Take your Bible, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 2. Judges, chapter 2. There's a lot, lot, lot I want to get out this morning. I know that worries you sometimes. So I want to try to move through and get to the thought that I want to get to this morning. So you just kind of bear with me if I move through some of these very fast. Follow along in your Bible if you can. I always like for you to look in your Bible. And I don't mind putting them on the screen. We put them on the screen for those that are watching. But even if you're sitting at home watching and, and Michael doing a good job putting those slides on the screen, I want you to open your Bible up and I want you to look at them, all right? And God will, God will show you things out of your own Bible you may not necessarily pick up from me. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall throw down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? You remember from last Sunday, there in chapter 1, if you look in uh, verse, uh, verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, neither, neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. 31, neither did Asher. Uh, verse uh, 33, neither did Naphtali. The, uh, neither did Dan. Verse 34, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And uh, I want you to think about, we, we talked last week who these inhabitants of the land were. And I want you to think now of your own life. I don't want you to think of anybody else. Don't worry about what you think. Somebody else needs to hear this. And, but I want you to think about your own life, because that's who this is for. It's for you. It's for my life, it's for your life, and these inhabitants are things that God has not delivered you from as far as, well, I'll just say there are things still present in your life that God will deliver you from. Do you believe that? But he hasn't done it yet. Sins that still need to be conquered. Lust, the fire of lust that needs to be quenched, not satisfied, not fed. Okay? Things our eyes shouldn't see. Things our bodies shouldn't want. Things our pride, our pride should have no place in the kingdom of God. Amen. What is it you've got to be proud of anyway? Because you ain't nothing but what God has done for you. Amen. You want to be proud of something? Be proud of God. Amen. You want to testify of something? Testify of what God, what Jesus has done in your life, not what you've done. So there are things in your life that are still there. You did not drive them out. And so the angel of the Lord says, verse 2 again, he said, You shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down the altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? So verse 3, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you. God said, I will not do it. But they shall be as thorns in your sides. And their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim. Does anybody want to take a guess at what the word bokim means? Just take a wild guess. Wept. It means weeping. The place of sorrow. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. It's not really part of the sermon. I'm going to ask you a question. When's the last time you cried? When's the last time tears ran down your face? When's the last time that the grief of your sin caused you to weep before God. When is the last time that's happened? If it's been a while, I could say, praise the Lord, I guess that means that you don't have sin. Or maybe it's because you haven't wept in a while over your sin. Maybe it would do you some good to do some weeping every now and then. Maybe it would do you some good to be sorry over your sins. And I think God says to you what my mom said to me. I will make you sorry. 
Amen? And she did it. I was sorry that I got caught in it. Oh, yeah, I guess I was sorry I did it too. Now look in verse 11. Verse 11. Let me get these so you can read them on the screen here. How's that? The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Now watch this. They just heard the angel preach. They heard the angel sermon to them. You did not drive out all the inhabitants. And they wept. And they were sorrowful. Right? And then what happened? Went out. Did it again. Sound familiar? Oh God, we're sorry. Oh God. And I, I believe the tears were real. Went out and did it all over again. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And by the way, you can only have one master. You cannot serve two at the same time. So if you're not serving God, you're serving Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. What does that word spoil mean? What does it mean when, he, when they, the spoilers spoiled them? What does that mean? Took their stuff. That you put food in the refrigerator, and lo and behold, three weeks later, you go to get it, and it's got juice running out of it, and stuff growing on it, and if it was really good, you're thinking, how can I shave that off and still eat that? It's spoiled, right? Something crept in and spoiled it. It means it took it away from you. And what will happen is, God will let you, God will put you under cruel authority. And then all of a sudden, whereas when you were serving God, everything was going well, you were paying your bills, everything was going good, your car was running fine, your health was in good shape. And then you turn your back on God, you got a little cocky, you turn your back on God, and God put you under a cruel authority. Now all of a sudden, you, you, got, you got checks to write, you just don't have no money in the checkbook. Bank accounts getting low. Things are not, the car breaks down, things are not working well, there's fighting going on in the house. I mean, God is, the, God is allowing the devil to steal your joy, he's stealing life out of you, he's stealing everything you got, and God is allowing him to do it. Who in here has ever been in that time? Say amen. Raise your hand. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not longer, any longer stand before their enemies. Watch this now. Because who's your enemies? you got three of them. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. you got three of them. Whereas before... You had the power to stand against those enemies. Now you don't have that power anymore. Because you, you forsook it. You walked away from it. Verse 15. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. See that word? The word stress is in the word distressed. Now there's stress. There's stress in the marriage. There's stress in the family. Stress at work. Stress in the church. Verse 17. Now I'll look at them back up a little bit. Verse 15. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord has said, and as the Lord has sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which would deliver them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. But it re for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Why don't you look at this where it says it repented the Lord. God heard you groaning. God heard the murmuring. God heard the distress that you were under. 
God heard the tears that you were that you were crying, the voice. God heard that and it repented him. God listen, God loves you. God cares about you. He's soft when it comes to you. He feels sorry for you. Like you would your children. Verse 19. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers and following other gods to serve them, to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because that this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I will also not henceforth drive out from them, before them, any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Now I want you to notice verse 22. Here it is, verse 22, right here. That through them I may prove Israel. I want you to stop for a minute. I want you to look up from your Bible, and I want you to look around this room. Look at everybody here. Look at me. Everybody sitting in here. My question is, who's going to be sitting here ten years from now? Who's going to be here five years from now? The proving ground that you really are who you say you are is the enemies that God left behind in your life for you to deal with. Because there's people all over town, all over America, claiming that they're Christians. Claiming it. But you and I both know that that's not really true. And the, the thing is, the people who would say, yeah, we know they're fake, bunch of phonies, yeah, a bunch of liberals. In the conservative churches, it happens too. It's not just the liberals. There are false brethren in fundamental Bible-believing churches everywhere. I'll tell you this. There's false preachers in fundamental Bible-believing churches everywhere. The proving ground is not how loud we can say amen when the preacher's preaching. The proving ground is how well you deal with your own sins. It's not that we agree with uh, all the right things and we're on the side of all the right things and we're against all the evil things in America. It is your own warfare is the proving ground for your life. The fact, listen to me now, the fact that you're still here today gives some evidence that you just might very well be here this time next year. Because you have already fought some battles, have you not? And I'm not talking about fought battles with other people. I'm talking about fought battles with you. Okay? That through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did or did it or not. Therefore the Lord left. I want you to underline it in your Bible. Verse 23, underline these words. Therefore the Lord left those nations. God left them there. Could God have taken them? Yes. But he didn't. Why? He's wise. God is wise. God knows that you, without an enemy, will not make it. You will not make it. I thank God for my enemies. I thank God for the pain that I endure sometimes. I thank God for my weaknesses. I thank God for everything that God has left in me. Because if I get up here and I preach a sermon that rings true in your life, it is not because I'm perfect. It's not because I'm better than you. It's not because I don't have, I don't have any battles in my life. I live a, a I live top of the mountain, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and I'm looking down on everybody today. That's not how it is with me, and it's not how it is with you. Let's get honest. You have things to prove you, just like I have things to prove me. 
Therefore the Lord left those nations. Without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So they're there. What did God warn them? Let's look at God's warning. Turn to Numbers 33. Let's pray. I didn't pray yet. Did I pray yet? Well, we better pray. Numbers 33, and then we'll pray. Well, I love that sound. I love that sound. Bible's going. Tsh, tsh. You're going to wear your Bible out doing that. Amen. Amen. You yourself will not be worn out. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for me. Pray for you this morning. Pray about your thorns. I've preached this, I don't know, probably a dozen times. I'm going to preach it again. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing. I ask for your help this morning uh, to preach this message. Lord, I've preached this many times. And Father, I'll probably preach it many more times. The Lord, it just seemed like this time, as I went through it, Lord, I saw things I didn't see the last time. And I thank you, Lord, that's how it is. So, Lord, if maybe there's somebody here today that's never heard me preach on this, Lord, it's new to them, pray, Lord, it'd be a blessing to them. Lord, if there's somebody watching online that's going to listen to this later on, some, on YouTube or Facebook or Sermon Audio, wherever, God may be the first time they've ever heard anything, that, Lord, it'll be a blessing to them. They'll understand, Lord, why they've not succeeded in getting rid of some of those stupid sins that so easily beset us. And Lord, there's somebody, always somebody out there to condemn them and tell them they're not really saved, that they're still sinning, they're not really saved. Lord, that's not how it is. So Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless and anoint this. I cannot make it work. I don't have the wisdom. You do. Your spirit does. It is, Lord, the illumination that's going to pop in people's heads, Lord, is going to be because you said something and not because I said something. But, Father, Lord, my job here is to awaken people to the word of God. So, Lord, help me to do that today. Pray that you'd bless the message. Let it be a blessing, Lord, for those that have been in church for years, those, Lord, that just came in. Lord, let it be a blessing to preachers and church leaders and church elders, dear God. From here to there to yonder, Lord, wherever, Lord, you take it, let it be a blessing. Thank you, Lord, for this church. And Father, I need this message. I need it just about as bad as just anybody else does. And I thank you, God, for the battles, Lord, that you've taught me how to fight. Thank you for it, God. I love you for it. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Numbers 33, verse 55. God said this, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you. Now, here's, here's what's going on. Numbers comes before the book of Judges. Numbers is the his, historical, is the prophecy of what was going to happen when Israel ended up like they did in the book of Judges. God knew it was coming. God saw it. Now, let me tell you something. The first time you ever bowed your head before God and said, God save me, God forgive me of all my sins, God I'm going to live victorious, God I'm never going to do some of these stupid things again, I'm never going to turn back to this stuff again, God from here on out it's going to be me and you and that's, that's how it's going to be until I roll on in glory. Now God did some things for you on that day, but God already saw the very next stupid thing you were going to do. And God decided to save you anyway. Amen? God, listen, the Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. So if, if God called you to salvation, he, it's because he already knows how the battle's going to go in your life. And God said, okay, I'll save you because I know how it's going to turn out. I know how it's going to work for him. I'm going to leave that stuff, I'm going to leave just enough stuff in there. So that he knows that it's not going to be like an easy roll right on into glory. He's going to have to fight for it. He's going to have to. He's, and I'm going to give it to him. In fact, it's already been given to him. But he'll be grateful that he's got it. Not arrogant that he's got it. God, listen, God don't like arrogant church people. And I don't either. I don't, I don't like them. I don't like these people running around telling about how, about how good they are. About how, how, good they're, how good everything is and this and that and the other. And they never talk about their own sin. They never talk about, they talk about everybody else's sin, but never announce to the world their own wickedness. 
I see that on fast, I see that on uh, social media, I see it, people posting all the time, doubting everybody for this, doubting everybody for that, but they will not name their own sins. I'm very leery about those people. So this is the prophecy. God already saw it. He said, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of you shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. You ever had, you ever had one of those in your eye? Well, hold on, I got something in my eye. Ah, boy, it's aggravating. All this getting me. And thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land. The Bible says Lot was vexed with the wickedness of Sodom. He had to, Lot chose Sodom and God let him choose Sodom. God let him roll on down there. He was, he was first just going to stay outside the city of Sodom and just you know plant his crops and raise his sheep and have the well-watered plains and all that stuff. The next time we see Lot, he's at the gate. He's inside, he's inside Sodom living there. And he was vexed with their unrighteous deeds. He saw it and it was having an effect on his life. It had an effect on his marriage. He lost his wife to Sodom. Lost his future inheritance because his sons-in-law, who would have raised up seed, his sons-in-law were killed in Sodom. They didn't believe it. They didn't leave. And that's how it ended up for poor Lot. He did not have your best life now. Did not have it. Did not turn out that way for him. And God saw it. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Whoa. And then in Joshua 23, 13, Joshua, last thing he said, last thing Joshua said before he died, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. Listen to me. God will allow you and lead you into a trap. Why? To put a stop to you. To put a stop to you, to teach you. To make you wise. It's not the young generation that we look to for wisdom, is it? I mean, they might be able to do stuff with the electronics that us older people can't do. They may be able to whiz through the Xbox with the greatest of ease. But they don't, we don't go to them for wisdom. It's the gray hair that we go to for wisdom. I, I need help with this. I need help with that. My girls are turning to their mama. Me and, me and Matthew now just seem like we have a better relationship than we ever used to have because he's learning the things that I had to learn at his age. And I got just a little bit more wisdom about it than he does. But that's just how it works. And when you fight these battles and you have to fight them all to your life, you get a little wise. You get a little bit more cautious than you used to be. We're not, listen, we're not daredevils anymore. We don't, we don't look at a bicycle and a ramp and say, I wonder how that'll turn out. He said, no for a certainty. There are going to be snares and traps unto you, scourges in your sides, thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord, God, Lord your God hath given you. Now listen to me. The good land. Number one, watch this now. There's two things here I want you to, to think about. Number one, you not coming to church. You're going to lose the land, the good land that God has given you. Sister Pam said this is a good church. How many of you agree with Sister Pam? You're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. Number two, heaven is a better land than this. Thank God. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose your good land. Why? Thorns. What do thorns do? I'm going to show you that. Okay? First of all, let's look at what thorns are. Back in Numbers 33, 55, he said, The inhabitants of the land from before you, the inhabitants of the land will be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. In Joshua 23, he said it was these nations... Uh, that are before you. There should be scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. These are the lost people who do lost people things and they have lost people religious ideas and they drink lost people's liquor and they, they sleep with lost, other lost people's wives and husbands and daughters and sons and they, they watch uh, lost people's TV shows and movies 
Are you catching this? These are the lost people. He said, you will, you will no longer be the influence on them. They will be the influence on you. And instead of you showing up to work saying, talking about what your preacher preached the day before, and said, written, and everybody saying, really, boy, I wish I could have heard that sermon. They show up to work and they, they say, boy, I heard, heard a good dirty joke this week, and you're going, what was it? What was it? I, I, I want to hear it. Boy, I watched a good movie uh, this weekend. Boy, it had a lot of nudity in it. Boy, there was people sleeping with one another. And boy, there was just all kinds of stuff going on. Really, what movie was that? Boy, I found a new website. Boy, it's got this on it. It's got dirty stuff on this. And, uh, really, what website is that? They have the influence over you. You don't have any influence over them. They don't want to hear about your preacher. They don't want to hear about your church. They don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear your Bible verses. They don't want to hear none of you. And yet everything they do and everything they say and everything they come up with, you follow. In fact, when things start going south in your life and in your marriage, you start listening to them. You'll go to them and say, well, I don't know. I think I'll, I don't know my wife. Well, she's just really all over me. And, and then, then you got a guy saying, no, I wouldn't put up with that. In fact, I didn't put up with my first three wives over that. They're going to, you're going to get caught in a snare. The inhabitants of the land, the people that are already there, they're the what's going to have the influence on you. And did, did that happen when the Israelites got into Canaan land? Is that what happened? They, they didn't know who Baal was. The Israelites did not know who Baal was until they got to Canaan. Now, I may not be 100% right on that, so don't write me an email. But we know for a fact that there were certain religious practices that the Israelites did not know about until they got into Canaan land. And because they didn't burn their altars down, because they didn't throw their temples down, because they didn't uh, smash their images like they were supposed to, they left them, and then they started asking, now tell us well, how you worship that God over there. How, how did you pray to this God over here? And they would tell them that, and they started incorporating that into their religious practices. I'm telling you, that's what's happening. Thorns identified. 2 Samuel 23, 6 says the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust, uh, thrust away. Th sons of Belial, everybody that's lost. A son of Belial is your family member. Your son, your daughter, your mama, your daddy, your uncle, your aunt, your cousins, your grandchildren, they're lost. They are sons of Belial. Children of the devil. The spirit is the spirit that is now works in the children of disobedience. And they will have an influence in your life. They'll say all the right things. They'll say things to you and you'll say, well, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Or, boy, but they, boy, they sin that way. They go to church and they get away with that. I wonder how, come, how, how I can go to church and still get away with their sin. Linda Carmichael, we got, we got churches all over this town that have people who are living in open fornication, who are living in open sodomy and still go to church. And leaders in the church. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. It's because the sons of the Belial are the thorns. They're messengers of Satan. And whatever Satan sends them out to say and whatever Satan sends them out to do, that's what these people are latching on to. That's what is influencing. Listen, we are being, at our churches all over this area and all over this country are being influenced by sons of Belial. We've got sons of Belial that are writing Sunday school literature. We've got sons of Belial that are writing music for the church worship service. We got sons of Belial that are standing behind pulpits. We got sons of Belial that are running Bible colleges and seminaries. We've got lost people who are who are uh, taking over and having dominion over churches everywhere. Do we want it here? Then you need to fight the fight. Genesis chapter 3, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and, how is, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. In fact, I'm just going to hold you to the fire, and I'm going to make you be honest today. Who in here, since you've been saved, will be honest enough to say, God said don't do it, and I've done it multiple times. Appreciate your honesty. So guess what you get in your garden? Thorns. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. 
for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. I've got a fan that sits up here, right here, for the very reason of this verse. I, I ain't kidding you. I sweat just about all the time. My face sweats. And my arm, you know me, I'm, I'm all messed up. My arms, I'm, I'm, I'm freezing up here, but I'm sweating. And it's because of this right here. It's because your preacher is no better, no different than anybody else. So I'm not, I promise you, I won't ever, I won't ever preach down to this church. Never. But because we did what God told us not to do, we get the thorns. If there's things about your wife that you don't like, and yet you love her, you've got thorns. If there's things about your husband that you don't like, and yet you love him, you've got thorns. You're going to have to deal with it. If you've got things in your children that you don't like, you can't do anything about it, you've got thorns. If there's people in my church that do things I don't like, I got thorns. I love them. I love everybody here. But I got thorns. Okay? That's how it works. We've got people in our lives that are going to do things to us that we're not going to like. And they'll try to have any influence over us. And they'll cause us to make wrong, stupid decisions. And we'll do them. But we love them. We got thorns. Matthew seven sixteen. He said, "You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather thorns? Do, ma do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles?" So I wrote this down. If it looks like a thorn, acts like a thorn, walks like a thorn, and quacks like a thorn, it's a thorn. That's pretty wise, isn't it? In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 5. Now, I'm getting to the message. Okay, I promise you, I'm working on it real fast. Ezekiel 2, verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall, yet shall, ye shall know that there hath been a prophet among you. Let me, ask, let me ask parents. Parents, everybody who's parented children in this building. Has your children ever done anything wrong that reminded you of you at their age and you went I'm getting it back for what I did to my mom and dad raise your hand Amen. oh my goodness Amen. call your mama or daddy if you can and say I'm sorry I should have done that you're getting it back and thou son of man be not afraid of them neither be afraid of their words though Briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. What he, ate him, what he gave him was the book. Now you listen to me. I have to preach this Bible, whether you're thorns or scorpions or not. I have to preach it to you. I have to give it to you. I have to deliver it to you. I have to say it to you. Even if I'm guilty of it, I have to say it to you. And I have. I've said it and preached it with me being guilty of it. I've got to say it. I don't necessarily consider this church a rebellious house. But let me make this application in your life. They will try to influence you. They, their words will come out at, at you as a dart. They will try to hurt you. They will try to beat you. Listen to me. You serve the Lord, and I promise you, you're going to have about 15 devils climbing all over you, stinging you and beating you mercilessly and trying to punish you so that you don't serve the Lord anymore. How many has ever had that happen? They will hate you. They will despise you. They will, they will look at you. They will try everything in the world to get you down to their level. Why? 
They don't like you. They don't like what you're saying. They don't like the gospel that's in your mouth. They don't like it. So they'll try back at you. They'll be rebellious. And they will try to get back at you and punish you for what you're, for how you're trying to live. And your own children will do it to you. Your own family will do it to you. Your, your cousins, your aunt, your uncle. They will do it to you. Why? Because they serve a different God. And then 2 Corinthians 12. This is what Paul said. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations... There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. How many times did Paul ask God to take this out? How many times, John? See what I'm holding up here? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Jaden's got three fingers back up there. Everybody look at Jaden. Three fingers. That's good, Jaden. Three times he asked God to deliver him from it, and God said, Paul, just give you grace. How's that? But you're going, to fight, you're going to have fight this fight. Now, everybody look at Hebrews chapter 6. Open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to try to open your eyes up to something. Or I'm going to, I'm going to let the Holy Ghost do it. If, God, if the Holy Ghost says this to you, then it's said. If he doesn't, then that's fine. I want us to look at this verse, this passage of verse that some people say, now, that, that, he, Paul didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean it was possible for this to happen. That's not how I see it. And I'm going to tie it together with this issue of thorns. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, he said, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew, the, uh, new, renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that, cup, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So you've got thorns in your life, Right? There is, you have to get them out of you. That's the fight that God gave you to fight. He said, watch this now. He said, I'm not taking them out. You are. You want them out? You take them out. You do what I tell you to do in order to get them out of your life. And if you will do these things, then yes, they will be driven out. But I'm not taking them out. If you want them out, you're going to have to take them out. And if I find you on judgment day with them still in your life, I reject that. And you know what happens? It's you're to be burned. Does everybody follow that? You, you tie this whole thing together with that. That people, everybody stop and say, well, if they shall fall away. Now, Paul didn't really mean that. It's not really possible to fall away once you're saved and this, that, and the other. I'm telling you. That there's some people sitting in church that aren't saved. And this is the proving ground of who is and who isn't. So you can tell me and all day long until the cows come home that you're saved, that you're born again. Oh, yes, I'm going to heaven. Oh, I'm a good guy. Well, this and that and the other. I don't know the difference. I don't know the truth. I can't tell the difference. Let's see the thorns. Tell us about the thorns that are in your life. Tell us about the stuff that you still deal with that you still got to fight. And let's see if you're going to be honest about it. Now here's the danger. Turn to, uh, turn to um, where do I want you to turn? Turn to Matthew 13. That's what I want you to turn to. I'm going to show you what happens here. Oh, t let's make it Mark 4. That's what I have on the screen. Mark chapter 4. Here's your danger right here. So you come to church this morning. And all week long, you let sin in. All week long. Didn't fight it. Didn't do anything about it. So Mark chapter 4, this is the parable of the seed and the sower. Here's the third group that doesn't go to heaven. He said, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. That's what you're hearing this morning, is it not? You're hearing the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the what? Lust. 
Should we have everybody stand up and tell everybody what they lust after? Nope. John says, nope. <laughs> All those in favor of John say aye. <laughs> the lust of other things enter in. What do they do? What are your thorns going to do? Choke the word. So you were out in sin all week. Didn't fight it. Didn't try to do anything about it. Just let, just do whatever you want to do. And everything I'm saying to you, those sins, those thorns are choking out the word of God and the power of the word of God in your life. It has no power in your life whatsoever. And it's choking out the word. And what's going to happen is you're going to end up being unfruitful. Which means you will not bear the precious fruit you will bear thorns and briars. And what happens to those who bear thorns and briars? They're rejected and nigh into burning. You see it? You see how it works now. You see, you see how these two are linked together. They're married. They're mated. None shall want or mate. And here's, here's what will happen. Turn to Joshua 23. Thorns will make you want to quit. Thorns will make you want to quit. I may, I may preach this in this quarter after now. I may preach this and let you go home with it. I have thought about quitting. Thought about quitting. It's happened before. It'll happen again. And there's always devils who will try to climb on me and say, Mike, leave your wife. Leave her. Get out. Okay? I'm not saying I'm saying that. The devils are saying that. Okay? I'm not saying I want to leave my wife every five minutes. But there's devils that climb on me and say, Mike, leave your wife. Leave her. I have a better vineyard for you. Like Ahab did, right? I have a better vineyard. Mike, leave the church. Just leave them. Just leave them. Just go on. Smite the shepherd, and I'll never forget the first time that happened to me here. I mean, I had devils all over me. And I could not for the life of me figure out what was going on. It was, it was vexing me. I mean, it, it, was, it was bad. And I got alone and I prayed. I used, to, I used to sneak off back here. And that was about the only room at the time that wasn't being used here. So I used to sneak off back here. And I'd pray. And I'd cry. And I'd just sit and, sit and think about it. And finally, I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And I went, that's it. That's what's happening. They're trying to get at me because I'm not, the one, I'm not who they want. They don't want me. They want the sheep. They don't eat shepherds. Wolves don't eat shepherds. They eat sheep. So if they got me out of the way, then they could have the sheep. And I went, I ain't doing it. Struck a pose. Anyway, I got up and I, I blessed the Lord and I tell you what, that was the end of that. And I'm just saying, sometimes you're innocent and they'll be there, but definitely, you listen to me, definitely with your own lust and pride, those things will choke out the word and you'll want to. Joshua 23, 11, take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise, go back. Go where? Go what direction? Back. Back to where you used to be. Back to the places you used to go to. Back to the people you used to hang around with. Back to the old sins that you used to do without any guilt whatsoever. 
Else if you do anywise, go back and cleave unto the remnant of those nations, even those that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of those nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. They, they will try, your sins will try to get you to quit. Isn't that true? You backslide. You get out and sin. That's the first thing. Your preacher knows it. The first thing shows up. You're not here. And your preacher knows it. Your preacher knows it. Because that's the first thing that shows up. All of a sudden you're not in church. You're not coming to Sunday school. You're not listening anymore. You don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You talk about You think about quitting. Remember what I said at the beginning of this? They'll take away from you the good land. Now, Sister Pam, are, are you still right? Are, is this still a good church? You want to be here a year from now? Your husband loved this church. He loved it so much that he purposed in his heart to bring his wife here so that when he died, she would be held in good hands. That is a huge responsibility. Why in the world did he dump her off on us? <laughs> Amen. That's a big deal. He left her in our hands. And sin will talk every one of us out of these doors. And I, Pam, who is it in this church you don't love? She, Pam loves everybody here. She's one of these people, it doesn't matter who you are, she loves you, amen? And you'll walk out on her. You will sin, your sin will cause you to walk out those doors, not on me, on her. She deserves better. You do it for Pam, right? You do it for the Lord, too. He'll talk you into quitting. My sin loves to talk me into quitting. So were yours. Quit reading your Bible. Quit praying. Quit coming to church. Quit wanting to be around Christian people. Now you want to be around sinners. I, I see it when it happens. I know it. I can, I can tell it. So can everybody else. It's happened. Before, it'll happen again. Don't let it happen. Let me, very quickly... I hate to just leave you hanging like this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 4. Let me just say this. They're on the screen here. Let me just read them real quickly. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame, and it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. What is it that can devour and burn the thorns. What is it? The Bible. The light of Israel. What can drive away what can drive away your sins? The Bible. What can remove the thorns out of your life? The Bible. Now watch this. What can remove them permanently? See, God said, I'm not going to drive them out. You are. And God has given you time and space on this earth to let this book drive out your enemies. And I can testify to you today, it works. It works. And then Jeremiah 4. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is what? What is fallow ground? It is ground that men have not plowed. And what happens to ground that men doesn't plow? It gets hard and it gets full of and thorns. Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. If you don't feed the thorn bushes, they won't live. Amen? Let's, uh, let's bow and pray.
I'm going to give you uh, time to let this sink in. I'm going to give you a moment to let it ponder it, think about it. Well, I didn't give you, I didn't give you this. What's well, good? Dragons like to live where thorns are, by the way. Don't let, the, don't let your stupid thorns choke the word out, people. Let the light of Israel burn the thorns out. Let the, let the plow of the word of God, the sword turn into a plowshare. Plow up that fallow ground. Dig them up. Get them out. Root and all. If you don't get the root, they'll come back. Everybody here this morning, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. I'm just going to ask you to consider the thought of your own stupid sins and the influence of, of sinful people around you and what it is that they're trying to do to you, what, how they're trying to lead you, how they're trying to get you, what it is that they're trying to talk you into, what it is they're trying to talk you out of. The devil does not want you serving God. He does not want you to open the Bible up. He does not want those things. And he will try to use the enemies that are in you to choke all of that out. And believe me, it'll work. I'd like to see you here a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now. I'm not interested in what I can produce as far as a response on an altar call. What I'm interested in is how much of the word in your life can prevent these things from happening to you. That's what I'm concerned about. Your pastor loves you. I did. I thought about it all week. thought about you all week. I love my church. I love my children. Never, ever, ever want to be separated from any of you. Father in heaven, we come before you today to thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. Thank you, God, for all that you've said to us, all the word that you've spoken to us, God. And I, I may have said things, Lord, today that maybe wasn't 100% right. Maybe I said some things, God, that I don't know, maybe, maybe people took it the wrong way or whatever. But God, I know that what you said today is right. And I know, Lord, that what you said today was truth. And if people don't receive it, then their problem is not with me, it's with you. Lord, you know best how to reach into the hearts and lives of everybody here. God, you know how to reach into my heart. God, you know what trips my trigger. You, God, you know what gets me on my knees. So, Father, I pray, God, that you do that more and more every day. Get me on my knees. Get my heart right. Get, me, get my mind in the Bible. God, you have delivered me from so many things. And yet, God, there's still things, Lord, to be delivered from. So, Father, I'm willing to learn how to fight. I'm willing, dear God, to be proven. God, I don't want to serve the devil. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to live an unrighteous life. So God, I'm willing to fight if you'll help me. Lord, let that be the prayer of everybody listening to my voice today. God, I'm willing to fight. If you're willing to help me, I'll, I'll fight. I'll plow it up. If you give me the plow, Lord, I'll plow it up. If you'll let the light of Israel burn in my heart, we'll burn some of that stuff out. We'll get rid of it, and I won't have to worry about it anymore. God, let that be the prayer of your people today. Lest they lose the fight and the thorns choke out the very word of God in their life. Father, bless this message. Bless these people. Lord, I love them. I know you love them more than me. So God, do in them, Lord, what I cannot do. May your name be praised. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.